Good morning. Good morning. Hope you're all doing well today. I am not coming close to you. I, it's not I'm being standoffish or whatever. I have something going on up here. So this is a quarantine up here. <laughs> and I want to keep you all safe over there. Thank you for being here. And let's open with a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you that we can come together in your house this morning. Bless us, Lord. Have your hand of blessing upon us as we learn from both the Old and New Testaments today. Uh, Lord, just thank you for everybody and their faithfulness to come to this early service. And may we just have a blessing as we open the Word of God together, especially during this communion uh, Sunday, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The first song is number 255, Down at the Cross, page number 255. Down at the cross where my Savior died Down where for cleansing from sin I cried There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name Glory to His name Glory to His name There to my heart was the blood applied Glory to His name. I am so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where He took me in. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. Glory to His name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. O oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I am so glad I have entered in. There Jesus saves me and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast your poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Glory to his name, glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood applied, glory to his name. And amen. A unison reading today comes from Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 4 through 6. I'm going to invite Brother Kerry Bodai to the pulpit to lead this in this reading as the rest of us stand. That is Deuteronomy chapter 34, verses 5 through 6. Please stand. And the Lord said unto him, This is the land which I swear unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob, saying, I will give it unto thy seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Bethpur, but not knoweth of his sepulture unto this day. Amen. You may be seated. I apologize for my voice. I'm sure it'll be more irritating to you than it will be to me. Last week, we concentrated on the events occurring during the final days of the Israelites' 40-year journey 
through the wilderness. Among these events, God choosing Joseph to be the next leader, the Israelites defeating the Midianites, and the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and one half of the tribe of Manasseh choosing to stay on the eastern side of the Jordan. Of all these events, there is one upcoming event that overshadows them all. Moses' death. Time is ticking away, the clock is ticking down, and everyone knows Moses must die and has to die before God will allow the Israelites the green light to enter into the land of Canaan. Right before he dies, Moses reminds the children of Israel that God, who is glorious, had led them through the wilderness and had visited them, giving them the law from Mount Sinai. Moses informs the children of Israel that God loves them, and he does. He promises to protect his people as they obey his words and worship him. Moses tells the Israelites that the Lord has great blessings in store for each of the 12 tribes. So Moses gathers all the people together and pronounces them the following messages from God. Now I'm going to give you the abridged version of these blessings of each of the 12 tribes. You, if you want to study them further, they're found in Deuteronomy 33. First, Moses proclaims upon the tribe of Reuben that they will always prevail and hope that their men will be many in number. Moses then wishes the Lord will always listen to the tribe of Judah and that the Lord will give them victory over their enemies. Moses then blesses the tribe of Levi for their faithfulness and promises that they will always be the priests of the children of Israel and that their enemies will be smitten. God promises the tribe of Benjamin that the Lord will keep them safe and cover them with protection. Moses declares to the two tribes descending from Joseph, Ephraim, and Manasseh that the Lord will always bless their land and give them plenty of water from their deep wells and dew from the sky. Moses then prays that the tribe of Zebulun will rejoice in their travels, just as the tribe of Ishakar will rejoice in their tents. Moses declares that the tribe of Gad, Gad will be blessed with great numbers, and they'll be fearless like lions. Moses tells the tribe of Dan that they will be strong like a young lion's cry and that the tribe of Naphtali is pleasing and will always be full of blessings. Moses proclaims that the tribe of Asher will have many, many children and they'll be loved by all the others. Now, if you're counting each of these blessings of the, tribe, of the 12 tribes on your fingers, first of all, congratulations on having 12 fingers, but probably you've only counted 11. For some reason, and we're not told why, the tribe of Simeon receives no blessing from Moses. Huh, that's curious, I wonder why. The only reason I can come up with is that the, the generations prior, Simeon's father Jacob curses his son Simeon, apparently for his cruelty and his violence, and Genesis 49.7 tells us because of this, Simeon's offspring will have no distinction of their own, but instead be scattered among the other tribes. And this becomes reality for the descendants of Simeon, but that's a whole other sermon. Moses concludes his reciting these blessings by declaring that God is eternal, and that he will protect all of his children and make them victorious. God will bless the Israelites. After declaring these blessings, God then leaves the plains of Moab and journeys through Mount Nebo to the top of Mount Pisgah. From there, Moses sees all the lands that can be seen. The Lord then tells Moses that he's beholding all the land that the Lord has promised to give his forefathers, namely Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, I don't want to draw too many parallels to this because doing so may, may be seen as heresy, but God leading Moses to the top of the mountain and showing him all the lands he could have inherited if Moses would have been more obedient to him reminds, reminds me a bit of the New Testament story of Satan taking Jesus onto a high mountain and showing him all the kingdoms of the earth Jesus could command if he would only obey Satan. Of course, that's where our parallels end. God is good, Satan is bad. Jesus is sinless, Moses is not. If anything, these two accounts are opposite reflections of one another. Anyway, after seeing the promised land from afar off, Moses dies. The Bible tells us that even though Moses dies at the ripe old age of 120 years, his eyes are still good and his body is still strong. This inclusion, the inclusion of this statement, 
might be telling us two things. Number one, the first is God took care of Moses, his health and his safety in the wilderness. You know, Moses never contracted leprosy like some of the others. He was never infected by a plague like some of the others. He was never bitten by a poisonous serpent like some of the others. And we know for a fact that at the time of his death, Moses is the oldest living member of the Hebrew children. All those younger than he have died. God blessed Moses with a long life and good health. God took care of Moses. The second thing Moses' health report tells us is that Moses could have gone on for a bit longer. There was no physical reason that he should die there that day on top of the mountain. Again, there was no physical reason, but there is a spiritual one. Moses was not allowed to take a step further into the land of Canaan. And the 40 years are up. It's time for the children of Israel to claim the land that is rightfully theirs. Moses must die in order for the others to live and to prosper and to build a great nation. As I mentioned last week, the second generation of Israelites are far from perfect, but they don't seem to be the gripers and the complainers and the haters of Moses that their parents were. The first generation of, of wilderness wanderers thought so negatively about Moses that on two separate occasions they picked up stones to stone him to death. I believe the second generation, their children, loved Moses a wee bit more. In fact, probably a bunch more. He's the only leader they've ever known. They were born in the wilderness. They grew up following him. The Bible tells us that the, the second set of Israelites mourned Moses' passing for 30 days. That's a long funeral, a month, 30 days. God privately buries Moses' body in the valley of the land of Moab. The Bible says, no man knoweth of the sepulcher until this day, and I suspect no one ever will. We'll never hear of some archaeologist coming across or stumbling across the grave of Moses. It's just not going to happen. So why does God hide the sepulcher of Moses? Well, we're not told why, but I suspect God doesn't want his Hebrew children to return to it. Once they are in the promised land, God never wants them to return back to the wilderness. If the burial place of Moses is known, the Israelites might be tempted to make annual pilgrimages to it. No, they waited too long to enter into the land of Canaan for them to ever return back to the wilderness. You know, that's much like us. There's a parallel there. We've all waited too long and suffered too much to go to heaven. Why would we ever want to turn around and return to this wicked old world? The second reason God hides Moses' sepulcher could be that God doesn't want Moses' enemies to find his body. If they could, they would undoubtedly, undoubtedly burn it molested or desecrated in some awful manner. God loves Moses way too much to allow this to happen. So is God powerful enough to hide a sepulcher for thousands of years? Well, yes, of course he is. If God could hide the many, many acres of the Garden of Eden without any human sense stumbling onto it, God can certainly hide a grave site from our prying eyes. But that's another sermon. There's a mystery remaining uh, at the end of Moses' life that has been debated for centuries, Moses wrote the book of the Deuteronomy as well as the other first books of the Bible. That's fact. Moses wrote this book. The mystery begins in Deuteronomy 34.5 and continues to the end of the chapter, the end of the book. The passage begins, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord, and he, the Lord, buried him in the valley in the land of Moab. All right, well... If Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy, which he did, but then Moses dies in the last chapter, which he did, who finished writing down the words in the last part of the book of Deuteronomy? In short, Moses is dead. He wasn't alive to write the fact down that he died and was buried. So who wrote this bit? Well, no one is sure. The accepted answer is that Moses wrote the book up until the last chapter, until his death. But then his successor picked up, picks up Moses' pen and finished writing the uh, few passages from, uh, from Moses' death until the end. That would be Joshua. Moses dies, so Joshua finishes the book. But I don't hold to that. We don't have to hold to that necessarily. I think Moses wrote his own death scene. And I base this conclusion on the fifth verse. 
I'll read it again. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab according to the word of the Lord. In other words, it hadn't happened yet. God is telling him this is what's going to happen. If I'm not right and I may be very, very wrong, Moses wrote his own death scene. He didn't come back to life. He didn't write it as a ghost writer. I think the words according to the word of the Lord tell us that the Lord dictates these words to Moses. Moses completes the book to the end and then Moses goes up to the mountain to die. But that's just my thoughts. Feel free to disagree with me if you wish. So in summary, was Moses' life a good life lived? Well, when we review it, he made several mistakes. Once upon a time, Moses killed an Egyptian, an Egyptian slave master and buried his body in the desert sands. Moses used his supposed poor speaking skills to, in order not to directly speak to the Pharaoh. He was hiding behind his brother Aaron. Moses threw down the first set of the Ten Commandment tablets in anger against the Israelites. Other than Joshua and Caleb, Moses never seems to get anyone's 100% support of his leadership. Even his brother and sister, Aaron and Miriam, often, Aaron and Miriam often spoke against him. Under Moses' leadership, God seems to curse Israel more than he blesses them. Moses hit the rock in anger instead of speaking to the rock to get water from it. But given all his failings, Moses dies in the presence of the Lord. In my book and in the Bible, the book, this makes Moses' life a good life lived. And that so concludes our story of Moses.
point, I'm going to invite Mr. Tom Anderson to the pulpit to lead us in our reading from Luke chapter 14. Please stand if you're able and comfortable to stand. Luke chapter 14, verses 8 through 10. Pastor, may I make an observation first? Yes, you're being recorded. There is certainly um, more time for people to have caffeine uh, before the 1045 service than the 930. This is much more interesting oh, and, yes. and jovial. So. Yes. Jovial. Yes. Exactly. At any rate, when thou art bidden of any man to a wedding, sit yeah. not down in the highest room, lest a more honorable man than thou be bidden of him. And he that bade thee and him come to say to thee, Give this man place, and thou begin in shame and take the lowest room. But when thou art bidden, go and sit down in the lowest room. That he that bade thee come. He may say unto thee, Friend, go up higher. Then shalt thou have worship in the presence of him that sit and meet with him. I am constantly looking for inspiration of what to preach next. As you know, today we will be having our monthly communion service, which commemorates, among other things, the Last Supper. This week I found inspiration in the word supper. A few times Jesus uses a supper, a feast, or a, a wedding banquet to bring home a point he is trying to get across to his listeners. He does so in a parable. This parable is going to be the center of my sermon this morning. And this parable comes to us from Luke chapter 14. In case you're new to all this, a parable is a story, fictitious in nature, which is told to relay a helpful truth. The truth to be learned from today's parable is not only spiritual in nature, but it works as very good, sound, daily advice. On one particular Sabbath day, Jesus is guest in the house of a Pharisee. Jesus is there to eat a meal. Why Jesus is invited to this Pharisee's house is a bit of a mystery. We don't know the background of the invitation. Overall, the Pharisees hated him. Perhaps he was invited only so the Pharisees could find something incriminating on Jesus Christ. In short, this dinner may be a trap. In fact, this passage in Luke tells us that everyone there is watching Jesus closely. There's one other possible explanation. Perhaps the Pharisee who invites Jesus to dinner is a friend. We know of at least one Pharisee who befriends Jesus Christ. His name is a, his, he is a man named Nicodemus, but that is another sermon. Either way, once at this house for a meal, one of the first things Jesus notices is there is differing seating. Not all the seats are alike. There's most likely a head table for more distinguished guests and side seating for less important guests. Perhaps those who have no importance at all, importance at all are invited to stand along the wall or to sit upon the floor. Jesus also notices that the Pharisees are all jockeying for positions for the better places to sit. They all have their eyes set and the, their backside set on the better seats. But Jesus isn't the, focus, isn't the only focus of attention that day. Among the others there is there, who is there to partake in the Sabbath meal is a man who is sick with the dropsy. Now, I'm told a dropsy is a condition which leaves the sufferer uh, swelling, puffy looking, and full of fluid. Jesus speaks up and asks the lawyers and the Pharisees, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? No one replies. They probably think he is insolent for speaking before he is spoken to. I'm sure you could have hear, heard a pin drop. Faced with this deafening silence, Jesus goes ahead and goes over to, the, to this man with dropsy, and he uses his miraculous powers to heal this man. Right before everyone's eyes, the man becomes noticeably healed of this dropsy. Although the Pharisees are silent during this healing, Jesus knows their thoughts and he knows their hearts. Jesus knows the Pharisees are thinking that he has just incriminated himself. The law states that no one is to work on the Sabbath day. Healing people would be considered work. Therefore, Jesus, who claims to be God, just sinned against God by healing this man. 
What a delicious predicament Jesus Christ has gotten himself into. In fact, this may be the most delicious thing on the dinner menu. And the Pharisees are ready to tuck in and take a big bite out of Jesus. But instead of giving them a chance to do so, Jesus speaks up. He asks, which of you shall have an ass or an ox fallen into a pit and will not straightway pull him out on the Sabbath day? In other words, if you guys, if you lost an ox or a donkey or, or, or some sort of livestock and he was in a pit, you would pull him out. It doesn't matter if it's a Monday, Tuesday or the Sabbath day. You would pull him out. You don't want that animal to suffer. Plus that animal has value. So what, which is it? Would you pull him out regardless of whether it's a Sabbath day or a Thursday? The Pharisees remain silent. It is wise for them to keep their big trap shut. This time it is Jesus who sets a trap for them. To speak up, they would fall into his trap. The Pharisees and lawyers cannot answer Jesus' question without incriminating themselves. If they are honest, everyone there without exception would confess to willingly and immediately pull their oxen out of a pit. Whether the clumsy ox falls in a ditch on the Sabbath day is inconsequential. Livestock are very valuable all seven days of the week. But this man, who has just been healed of the dropsy, is not livestock. He's a human being. And their own law states that the lowliest man is more valuable than the most expensive livestock. It would kill the Pharisees to admit it, but they cannot fault Jesus for saving this man from his impairment when any one of them would have rushed to save an oxen from harm. But Jesus isn't quite done yet. After getting these Pharisees and lawyers to think about things they would rather not think about, he tells them a parable, and they hang on his every word. He has their attention. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, may that be the last. Anyway, Jesus then paints a picture of a wedding. He asks the Pharisees and lawyers if they were invited to a wedding feast. Would they just presume to take the groom's seat or would they just sit willy-nilly down upon a chair reserved for the mother of the bride? The, the answer is obvious. They would not. First, taking the seat of a more honored guest would cause all the other guests to whisper about, the about their arrogance behind their backs. The other guests couldn't believe how presumptuous a fellow guest would be for taking a seat not reserved for themselves. And second, when they are asked to kindly move their backsides to make room for the groom or the bride's grandfather or whoever the seat is reserved for, they're going to be embarrassed. They're going to look like an arrogant, pretentious idiot. As a pastor for many years now, I have officiated more than a few weddings. It's not common, but once in a while, this sort of thing actually happens. As our culture pulls further and further away from a proper standard, from polite customs, people are becoming less familiar with wedding etiquette. People these days don't know that in a wedding, the right pew, the first right pew is reserved for the groom's parents, and the, I have to, I have to turn it, because I'm usually facing this way at a wedding, the left pew, is that left? Yeah, that's left, is reserved for the, the bride's parents. And anyone who would just willy-nilly sit in one of those seats would be seen, anyone other than the parents, would willy -nilly, who would just sit in those seats would be seen as pretentious. And I've seen more and more reserve signs being utilized because people don't know that those, those two pews, those two seats, are reserved for other people. And I've seen more reserve signs being used um, you know, to, to clear out those pews. Younger, unlearned guests see these prime seats and they think that, think that they're perfect for taking selfies as the bride walks down the aisle. You can get the bride and you, hey, look at this. But that's not, that's not the purpose of their seats. A couple of times, just a couple of times, five minutes before the wedding is to begin, I've had an usher come to me and say, Reverend, what do I do? There's someone sitting in Mrs. Johnson's seat. Then it becomes my job to go over them and quietly ask the interloper to please move. And they always do, sometimes unapologetically, but they will move. But let's get back to our parable. So I kind of understand this. Jesus is asking these Pharisees to consider how they would feel if they were publicly asked to remove their bottoms at a wedding feast because they arrogantly presumed to sit in a chair of a, a member of a wedding party. And of course, they would feel ashamed. 
Jesus then gives them some very good sound advice. Instead of thinking too highly of themselves and unknowingly taking a seat reserved for someone important, would it not be better to think of themselves as lowly and take a seat that is not in the spotlight? If they sit down in one of the seats reserved for just the common folk, they can save themselves any embarrassment. Plus, Jesus points out there's an added bonus to sitting in a humble spot. If the guest is of importance, when the host of the wedding sees them sitting in a lowly seat, the host will no doubt insist they move to one of the more noteworthy seats. If this happens, then all the other wedding guests will be witnesses to them getting an upgrade to a seat of honor. So which is better, Jesus asks, for the other guests to witness you getting a downgrade or for the other guests seeing you get an upgrade? And the answer is obvious. As I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, there's a mighty fine, so, this is mighty fine social advice, but this lesson is suitable, uh, and this lesson is suitable for proper etiquette, but don't forget this is a parable. This means that it also has a spiritual lesson to be learned. Jesus doesn't keep us guessing of the parable's moral. He tells us, for whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Jesus Christ is talking about heaven and the humility it takes to get there. In short, if we feel we deserve heaven, especially if we feel we've lived such a great life that we should have the best seat in heaven, we'll get a downgrade. In fact, it's the ultimate downgrade. But if we are humble and we accept firsthand the grace and mercy of God, and if we feel that we'd be just fortunate to sit in a cold, dark, damp, corner of heaven. By the way, there are no cold, dark, damp corners in heaven, but if we just got that, we would feel so grateful. We'd be, we, we would feel like we've been upgraded. There's one last lesson I believe Jesus tells in, in this parable. There's within it an attitude lesson that we can use here on earth. Do you remember the man Jesus healed, the one who had dropsy? No doubt this whole parable was prompted by this man's presence, or more to the point, the reaction, the behavior of the other guests toward this man's presence. Jesus makes time to throw a little lesson in about the golden rule. I think it goes without saying that this man with dropsy was not given the best seat in the house. His condition made him unsightly. No doubt he was told to sit on the floor if he was even allowed to eat with the other guests at all. The Pharisees are all about appearing righteous. How would it appear if this man who is less than attractive was seated in a place of respect. Jesus is again telling these important Pharisees and lawyers that they have it all backwards. They would have appeared more righteous if they had shown this man mercy and honor. Instead, of, instead they probably treated him shabbily. If one of these hoi polloi, muckety muck Pharisees would have gotten out of their seat, gone over to this poor man with dropsy and offered him their seat of honor, that Pharisee would have looked more like a hero than a villain to the public. That Pharisee would have looked more righteous, not less. The Pharisees have this idea backwards, and sometimes, unfortunately, so do we. At this time, let's all stand. We'll sing one verse of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, page number 560 in your hymnals, followed by the Lord's Prayer. Blessed be he the tie that binds Our hearts in Christian love The fellowship of kindred minds Is like to that above I hope you have a wonderful week ahead. I'm going to invite Brother Mike Thomas to the pulpit to close our service with the Lord's Prayer. Before we recite the Lord's Prayer, I'd like to say a prayer for everybody on our prayer list, so please bow with me. Heavenly Father, we just ask your hand of blessing and healing upon all on our prayer list and all those that are caring for them, that they may get the best care, be with them as well, and let them feel your presence in their lives. We pray all this through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen to you, and thank you for coming. You're